All right. Are we all okay to start? We all have good food, rested. Whoa, I saw it. Okay. <laughs> no more questions. Um, uh, how's everyone doing? Everyone that's okay, say, I'm okay. Ooh, see, that's how you really know. Um, this talk is actually in English. Is everyone okay with English? <laughs> I like <the> enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask that in the middle of the presentation, too. Um, so, ooh, let me talk a bit. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Murillo. Uh, this is the Faster Python with Friends talk. So, before, like, what are you in for today, right? So, there's still time to leave. The door's still there. But what are we going to talk about? We're first going to have a little introduction, right? Like, is Python really slow? What do we mean by that? Then I'm, I did a little experiment to compare some things. So, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Then we're going to talk about Python 3.11, some basically some different ways that you can try to speed up your Python script, right? So Python 3.11, PyPy, Cython, MyPyC. We're going to talk about bindings with PyO3, so that's Rust. Um, and then we're going to talk about Mojo, and then some closing thoughts. And then, of course, if I do my job well, you'll have some time for questions as well, okay? Um, now that no one left yet, so I think I can continue. Um, who am I? My name is Murillo. So I'm, uh, I'm from Brazil, actually. I live in Belgium nowadays. So I do understand a bit of Spanish, um, but not enough to do a talk in Spanish. Uh, so I hope that's okay with everyone. I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering in the US, and I did my master's in Belgium at, uh, in for artificial intelligence. I have some certifications here, not super relevant for this talk, but I like to put it there. Um, some fun facts. So ooh. as you could have guessed, Python is the, the language that I'm most my bread and butter, let's say. But lately, I've also been interested in Rust, right? So I think there is a, more, a move to Rust in the Python ecosystem, right? I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, but this is something that I've been trying to pick up here and there. And last but not least, I'm also a big uh, chicken advocate. In Belgium, actually, households have chickens. And apparently, it's a really good deal. Like, you give the throwaway food, they give you eggs. Great deal. So I just wanted to advertise that I'm a chicken advocate as well. Um, in Belgium as well, I like knowledge sharing, so I also organized the Python user group in Belgium. So after going to some conferences, I was looking for something like this in Belgium, and there wasn't, so we decided to start one. Um, and also nowadays on my day job, I'm a tech lead for the AI business unit at DataRoots. So we're a consultancy company. We do everything around data and AI, so data engineering, cloud engineering, artificial intelligence, and whatnot. Um, and this is the context that I was first introduced to, well, AI, right, to Python. Um, and this is where I touch more Python nowadays. But I must admit that Python in the beginning was a bit confusing when I was learning it, right? Because on one hand, you hear like machine learning, you need data, you need compute, you know, you need a lot of these things. And on the other hand, you, you hear that Python is slow, right? And that really boggled my mind, right? Am I the only one, like maybe, uh, can you clap if you've ever heard that Python is slow? <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you also clap if you actually think that Python is slow? OK, some more shy claps, right? But that's true, right? Because I, I, I never had an issue with Python being slow, but that's kind of what you hear everywhere. Like, oh, Python is slow, Python is slow, it's not a real language, blah, 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 it's physical code, whatever. So I was like, is Python really slow, right? So I did some Googling, right? This is a very small, uh, the, the letters are very small, but Python is actually ending up here at the bottom of this uh, comparison, right? Um, so I was like, I want to see things for myself. I have a, let's say, a healthy skepticism when I see benchmarks, especially when the person that created something is the one doing the benchmark, right? So I was like, let's, let's, let's try something, right? So maybe the first uh, disclaimer, right? All benchmarks are wrong, and I'm saying this in the, in the sense that, have you, has anyone here uh, seen like SQL benchmarks, for example, right? It's like, it's very weird. It's like, oh yeah, if you have group by, if you have three group buys, two wear clauses, and this amount of data, then this is the fastest one. But if you have one group by and three wear clauses, then this is the best one. And it's like, oh, okay, but like, which one is it, right? So, and I think this just says something about benchmarks in general, right? I think it depends a lot on your code. It's very user specific. And that's why I wanted to try something that I didn't see any other, any other place. And it is like neutral. But this is also wrong. Right? Like, if you try this out, you may have different results, and uh, your problem set is probably going to be very different. So this is just the first disclaimer. Another second disclaimer that is a bit hidden is that I was trying these things out. Right? I'm not a maintainer. I'm not an expert on these things. But I wanted to try because I hear about all these technologies, and I wanted to see how they compare and how easy they are to use. Again, another piece of 
healthy skepticism, right? And you see like this framework is like, oh yeah, it's gonna solve all your problems. And then you try and it's not really like that, right? And that's kind of how I wanted to feel a bit. So I did two little experiments, right? One is just calculating the Fibonacci. This is something I saw on documentation. So, um, and the other one is just calculating triangles in a network, right? I think uh, graph stuff, it can be very compute intensive and it takes a long time. So I thought this could be a good, easy, like byte uh, size experiment to try out. So Fibonacci, if you're not familiar, is the one there. Basically, the Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two. And the triangles on the network is literally, like if you have an uh, undirected network, like uh, if you have friends on Facebook, uh, you can actually see how many triangles are there, right? So if I know you and I know you, do you know each other? And you can see how many times this happened in your network. Everyone's okay? Clap if you're okay still? You're with me? Sucks. I don't anything, so thanks. Um, the code is going to be available, so it's going to be on my GitHub there. This is kind of the project uh, structure, and this is going to be because I have some demos, right? It's actually a recording, but just so you know how it's laid out. So let's first see the baseline. So Python 3.10. So very quickly here, I'm just basically activating the virtual environment, which is Python 3.10, and then I'm just running a script, right? So this is basically because I'm importing things dynamically, right? So this is the Python backend, so it's really just pure Python code, right? I'm not going to go into too much details, but you can try it out to yourself later. And in the script, there are different things that it does, but then it's calculating the Fibonacci for the 40th Fibonacci number, okay? And then it actually takes 31 seconds, and this is the number, okay? Nothing too exciting um, yet. And then can I calculate the number of triangles? Same thing. Activate the virtual environment, which is Python 3.10. And then just run the script. And the data, by the way, is actually from Facebook as well. It's like a Facebook data that was open on the, it's like open source, right? It's on the internet. Okay, so this one took 133 seconds. Um, I put as well when I'm comparing, so you don't have to remember all these things. So, can we make Python faster, right? And I think we can. Um, actually, there's been a bit of the news, right? Like Meta, so face previously known as Facebook. They actually de they're committing to dedicating Python engineers to removing the gill with something that would speed up Python as well. And when I said that, when I shared those news, one colleague of mine, he was like, is this, do we really even care, right? Like Python, the things that need to be faster, they are already written in some other language and bind it into Python. Um, and I would argue that, well, so uh, do we care? And I would argue that yes, we do care, right? Um, I also think that performance a lot of the times is not a must have, right? Like if you have something with a user and the user have to wait one second, that's not too bad, but if the user can wait half a second, that's even better, right? So I think it is something we should think of. And this is also a trend that you see in Python, C Python development in general, right? There was the fi faster C Python project from Microsoft that uh, it was really impacted on 3.11 and actually it's continued on 3.12, which was released, I think like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and also Python 3.12 also has some improvements on async IO. Uh, they also started doing some work on the gill, right? To have different gills for different threads and whatnot, and they're actually attempting to have the no gill Python of, of 3.13, okay? Um, and maybe just another disclaimer, so for example, async IO is something that they claim that was like 65% improvement, but none of my code has async IO, right? So you're not gonna benefit from this. And again, this just goes back a bit to all the benchmarks being wrong, okay? So let's look at Python 3.11. So I think that's the, the one that was a really hot topic, let's say. So again, the code is going to be the same, right? So actually, if you see uh, pom pom, you see I'm still using the Python, right, imports. So it's exactly the same thing that I did before. And instead of taking 31 seconds, it took 19 seconds, right? So it is, there is an improvement there. Um, and the same thing for the, the triangles, right? So I activated a different virtual environment, the 3.11. I use the same, uh, let's say, calling the same code, right? but now it's Python 3.11, and it takes less, but it's not that much less, right? So the triangles example is one that you see that didn't benefit as much from the performance improvements. And then I was also curious, like, why is that, right? Why is, um, why is this, uh, the, the triangle example, Ooh. why is the triangle example not always faster, right? Um, so I did some digging as well, and apparently it's because the way that Python is improving the performance is, maybe I'll actually need to pause this here, is by actually creating specialized bytecode, right? So everyone, ev so if you're okay with me saying bytecode instructions, clap your hands. <laughs> Not very reassuring, but okay. But basically Python 
is compiled to bytecode and the bytecode is interpreted, right? So bytecode are still instructions, right? If you have a pickle file, that's bytecode instructions as well, by the way, right? So um, here I'm activating a virtual environment. I'm defining a very simple function and I'm using the disassembly module to look into it, right? Um, when you pass in the function, you see the, by, uh, the bytecode instructions here, right? And now what I'm gonna do is I'm basically just gonna call this function a whole bunch of times, to be specific, a hundred times, right? So you can see here that we have a binary operation and then, oh, uh, this is maybe too fast. And after we executed a whole bunch of times, we have a binary operation multiply integer. So basically, Python in the interpreter says, oh, you're executing this a lot of times, we can specialize this, and this can be faster, right? So you can imagine that something like uh, the Fibonacci, because you're also summing things over and over and over again, these specialized uh, bytecode instructions are actually very useful. But the, on the triangle, you don't do that as much. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna experience that much uh, the, performance benefit, the performance improvements. Okay, so it's a bit. Uh. So to exemplify that, I wrote another function that basically just checks if an element is inside a sequence, right? And then if I run this again, so the same thing, this, is the, the, this module, you see again the instructions, and if I run it again, and I print it again, you're gonna see that it's the same bytecode instruction. So basically, we cannot specialize everything, okay? All right, so um, this idea of let's see how the program is running and optimize for the most performing, the most critical things, right? It's not something new, and uh, this is also something that led me to think about PyPy. And I had actually tried PyPy, but I heard a lot about it. So maybe can you clap if you ever heard of PyPy? <laughs> can you clap if you used PyPy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. I was I was in the same boat, right? So I was like, well, PyPy, it has a, a well, first and foremost, right? It's very close to the official C Python implementation, right? So it's basically a drop-in replacement, right? It's like a different interpreter for the language, meaning that you can just call it on your script and you don't have to change anything most of the time, and it would actually just run, right? It's written in R Python, which is actually not Python, it's reduced Python, but don't have to worry too much about it. It has some JIT compilation, JIT compilation meaning just in time, meaning that as it's running, you will see the things that it's running a lot and you can actually compile that to machine code, right? Which is not what Python 3.11 is doing, okay? Um, so again, some pro pros, it's much faster and it has very little to no overhead. But there are some cons, of course, right? Uh, well, let me just uh, dum, dum, dum. move the cursor. Oof, this doesn't work. Okay. Um, you cannot ship the pre-compiled binaries, right? So it's just in time compilation. So there are some binaries there, but you cannot you cannot actually share this to someone, right? The best thing I can do is to share my script, and then you run PyPy on my script, and that's because the way that PyPy works apparently is that it points to some things in memory after the objects are created, right? And you cannot know that ahead of time. Okay. Um, probably it's not worth for sh uh, short scripts. There is a cost of compiling. So if you have something that runs very, uh, like a very s short process, you're probably not gonna benefit as much from these improvements. And also it has some uh, issues with the C Python, the C extensions in Python, okay? Which is actually one of the reasons why Python is so popular, right? So, again, <laughs> I wanted to try out to see for myself. So I did a small example here with NumPy, right? NumPy is also, um, is it with C extension? Uh, can you see this? Is this too small? Right? So I basically have that very simple script where that just basically computes the mean of an array, right? And you see here that Python 3.10 took 0.48 seconds and Python uh, and PyPy took actually uh, 0.53 seconds, right? So this is again just to say it's not a silver bullet, it's not gonna work all the time. But if you have something that is pure Python, it's a very good alternative, right? Actually, uh, in the documentation, they say if you have something that has a C extension and you really need the performance speed, then rewrite it in Python, in pure Python, and then run PyPy, which I don't know if I would do that. But anyways, oh, yeah, maybe. A so this is basically the, the, the for loop, right? I did this five times and I computed the mean. All right, so let's see how PyPy performs with the, the triangles. Oh, actually, I think we skipped one. Huh? Ooh, sorry. This is silly. Then you can. So if you compute the, the Fibonacci number, again, now I'm using a PyPy environment, right? But I'm still executing the Python backend, let's say. It's basically just Python code, right? Basically, what I'm trying to say here 
is that the script that I'm executing is exactly the same in all the three that we've seen so far, right? But I'm using the PyPy interpreter, right? And we see that we go from 31 seconds to 5.9 seconds, but that's because it's also pure Python script. Cool? And if I compute the triangles, same thing, activate a virtual environment with PyPy, and then I basically run the same script with the same Python backend, let's say. And it takes a while, uh, 5.99 uh, 5 seconds, so a huge improvement, right? Cool, cool. Um, and then, like, we're talking about compiling just-in-time compilation, right? And then I start to think, like, okay, Cython is, uh, maybe, who, who here worked with Cython? Ah, yeah, I see, sorry. Clap if you <laughs> worked with Cython before. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, who, I'm assuming that most people heard about Cython, right? So, okay, so Cython, I didn't try, so I was curious, right? So I gave this, uh, I gave this experiment a shot. The idea with Cython is that it, it transpiles your Python code into C code that you can install back in Python as a C extension, okay? Um, it's still active, actually. Python, uh, Cython 3.0 was released not too long ago, right? Again, what I mentioned. Uh, it's, not, it's not only Python. It's, it's a bit actually like a superset. So basically, everything that you have in the Python code will work, but then you also could use the C def and C imports kind of things, okay? Um, once you're on the C level as well, there are ways you can actually bypass the GIL because, again, you're not in Python land anymore. You're on C land. And uh, it has some limitations, of course. It's not a true superset, right? Uh, just here, very quickly, uh, just the two ways. So like I said, Cython is a superset. You could use pure Python here, right, with the type hints. So this is actually valid Python code, right? It's just that you're importing Cython and you're adding that as a type hint. Or you can actually use the Cython, the PyYX extension, right? So you have the CDEF, you have some other things here, like this double, this is not pure Python code, right? So if I try to run my Python interpreter here, it won't work, but here it will, right? So they're both accepted, and this is one of the things that they've been working on. In my example, right, for the Fibonacci number, very simple. I just add from uh, int to cython.int, right? But they actually both work in Cython. But just so you have an idea. So let's see. I actually created the extensions, right? So I, create, I activate the virtual environment, which has Cython uh, installed. It actually has a CLI tool, so you can actually do Cythonize. And then you see that now we have some C and some uh, SO extensions, right? So those are the C extensions that, that come in. Um, so now I'm using the Python backend, right? So the normal type-ins, and you see that there is some improvement. Ooh, too fast, sorry. Right, so you see here that we go from 31 seconds to 11 seconds, so it's a third of the time. But if I actually use the Cython type-ins, Right, so again, same thing, I, I create the extensions, but now I'm using this Psy backend, which is actually the same script, but the type hints are different using the Cython type hints. And then we see that we go to six seconds. So even a further improvement, right? Um, for Cython the triangles as well, you're gonna see something similar. First I compile with the normal Python type hints, and then I did it with the Cython extensions, okay? And then, let's see, scripts time Python. So using the Python type hints, you see it goes from 130 to 131, so not a huge improvement. Um, and then if you go to the Cython extensions, then you go to 127 seconds. So it's still not that great, but then it's also because Python has some dynamic properties to it, right? So some of the stuff is not gonna, like same thing we saw for Python 3.11, right? Not everything is gonna affect your code the same. Cool? Which also got me thinking, right? We have already type hints in Python. Maybe actually when Cython was created first, I don't think he had, it was there. But now we do, right? So what if we just use the native Python type hints? And that's actually what MyPyC uh, comes in, right? Um, in their documentation, I was looking for what exactly are the differences, but you see here that MyPyC targets many similar ca use cases, but then basically the way that they do things are a bit different, right? You don't need to import this weird type hints and whatnot. So let's see how it actually performs. So I put both uh, baselines here, so Python uh, 3.10, but also Cython, just to see how it looks. So I just call MyPyC. Again, it's, it actually comes with MyPy. Um, also has the C extensions and the binary, actually just the binary, the dos, .so files here. And then if I run the same thing with the Python type-ins, the normal Python code, you see that I already go from 
six seconds in Cython and 31 from the Python 3.10 to 1.68. Yeah, so it's pretty good. And also the way that they, in the documentation, they also recommend you doing this. For example, if you're developing, you would use Python, the interpreter code. But then, if you're actually making a pull request in CI/CD, then you can actually compile the things, right? So that's actually a way that they recommend, which I actually think it fits really nice with a lot of uh, projects. Ooh. And now the triangles. Same thing, activate the virtual environment, use my PyC. And then if I run this with the Python backend, so normal typing, you see that it goes from 127 seconds to 117. Still an improvement, right? But it's way less effort because you don't need to translate your Python code as long as you have type ins. Right. Ah, maybe one thing I will mention as well before about my PyC is that if it expects your type ins to be correct, right? So maybe I'm talking about type ins a lot. MyPy, everyone here use MyPy? Clap if you have. <laughs> Not as strong <laughs> response as I hoped, but okay. But uh, MyPy also it does slow you down a bit, right? Like having the static type checker, you have to make sure that everything corrects. Uh, in MyPy, if you use MyPy C on a piece, on a code base that the types don't match, you can just throw some type errors, right? Which is not super helpful, but it is a limitation, let's say. So, uh, again, up until now, we talked about Python translated to C to create extensions to go back in Python, right? But then it's like, what if we skip the, the steps from Python to C, right? What if we just write something C and then we bring it to Python, right? And that's where bindings come in. Um, so, the way I see bindings, a very, uh, let's say, hand-wavy way of talking about it, is basically to integrate different languages together, right? So in the C is the C to Python, um, and that's actually where my confusion when I was studying Python came from, right? So if you look at libraries like TensorFlow or PyTorch, it's actually C. It, ha it actually has a C++ API, but then it's actually uh, it's binding to Python, right? So you can actually call, when you're actually calling a TensorFlow function, it actually has C++ running underneath, right? So also if you're debugging TensorFlow code, sometimes you get some weird C++ errors, which is actually very tricky. Um, and also the previous talk on the, the from Pablo uh, about the profiler also relates to that, right? Because then now they're making work so everything integrates nicely together, right? The Python and C++ layer. And as I mentioned before, lately I've seen uh, a shift from C++ to Rust and projects like Polars or Pydentic they actually have the Rust backend, right? And then you have a binding into Python, so you can still use the Python API, but in the back is actually uh, Rust code. Um, the way that it works, actually, is that CPython, which is the main Python interpreter, the implementation, they actually expose the C API as libpython, right? And Rust has a way to interact with C uh, libraries and packages, right? It's the, the FFI, the foreign function interface. So actually, Rust, uh, it connects to, to well, it knows how what to expect from Python. And also Python, you can actually create almost like a C extension from Rust that you can install it back in Python, right? So actually you can do both things. You can actually run Python from a Rust program or you can run Rust from a Python program, okay? All right, so let's see how do we do this. Um, Rust also has a very nice ecosystem, right? So first thing I'll do here, I'm activating a, the same virtual environment from Python 3.10, and then I'm actually going to the Rust directory, right? So there I actually have my module. Um, and then I also use this tool called Maturing, which also comes from PyO3, which it makes things super easy to bind a Rust backend into a Python program, okay? So basically I just run a Maturing uh, develop, and then you see that it compiles all the Rust code that I have, and it would actually insta install into the current active Python that I have, okay? So if I do this and I have the right virtual environment activated, then that's it, I don't need to do anything else. Then I go back in the, the root directory and I'm running the, oh, actually this, ah, this is not, yeah. And then I'm running basically the same script, I'm just changing, now use the Rust package that we just built. And then you see that it goes from 31 seconds to two seconds. Right, so a big improvement, which I guess is not that surprising because it's Rust, right? So <laughs> it's kind of expected. I'm saying this too because I, <laughs> I gave this talk a while ago and people were like, yeah, of course it's gonna be, uh, it's, it's Rust, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, why are you surprised, uh, what are you trying to say here? Also because I feel like a lot of the Rust people are like Rust evangelists, right? Like <laughs> Rust is the best and, this, and I like it, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not that extreme, I'm not that, uh, but anyways. So can we do better? Yes, we can. Um, 
we can actually pass in maturing with the release flag, which is the same thing that you would do with Rust, with cargo, with, um, and basically optimize even further, right? So again, it compiles everything with the release flag on. It would install in the current active virtual environment, and if I run it again, you see that it takes 0.7 seconds. So big, big improvement, right? And again, this is it, huh? Like the whole lib Python C, how it interacts, you don't have to worry about it. It actually is abstracted for you. And basically all you need to change is in the pyproject.toml to put the maturing backend. So very, very, very convenient. Ooh, I uh, saw some sneak peek there. Hold your horses, we still have to talk about the triangles. Um, same thing, right? So activate the virtual environment, go to the project and develop, it will compile, it will install. I'm gonna run first without the release flag. So again, 133 seconds, now to 86 seconds. And now doing the same thing with release, compiles everything, installs in your active virtual environment, and it takes three seconds. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Now, I don't know who was waiting for this, Mojo. So clap if you heard about Mojo. Okay, clap if you work with Mojo, if you tried it out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sounds about right. But I was curious about it, right? So indeed, it made a lot of noise in the AI community, especially, I feel, right? Um, my take, so I tried it, my impression of it. It's a separate programming language, right? Um, it's very early stages. Uh, it's, it aims to be a superset of Python. And maybe before you, <laughs> I'm saying it's a different programming language, I know I'm in PyCon, so before you boo me off stage, right? Like, let me make my case. It does try to be a superset of Python, and I would even say that Cython, it's also a superset of Python, right? So it's, are we really talking like where the lines are drawn? It's a bit blurry. Um, so it's very early. It's not a drop-in replacement yet. It actually came from the AI engine project from Modular. So they didn't set out to say, oh, I'm going to create a new programming language. They wanted to create this AI engine for the large language models to run efficiently, and then Mojo came out of that, right? So it's statically typed, and it is compiled. So if you say x is equal to high, and then x is equal to 2 in Mojo, it, that won't fly, which in Python it does. So that's another difference that I noticed. Um, and again, considering everything, it feels like a different programming language with a Pythonic syntax, right? It has a high and low level API for the, perform the high performance stuff. It also has some specific built-in AI features, right? Uh, because again, it came from the AI engine project. Very early stages, so there are still a lot of rough edges, and they do acknowledge that. So there are no comprehensions, no dictionaries, no keyword arguments, and no classes even. But it still integrates with Python. So if you have some Python code, you can actually translate that Python object into a Mojo object, right? So that's how they intend to cover all the gaps. And you can try yourself. You can actually go modular. You still need to sign up, right, Just to get the, the binaries, the, the executable. But you can go there, you can sign up, and you can try it out as a CLI or the notebooks. Here are some examples of some projects that I've seen. Uh, Mojo libc, is a, I thought it was really cool that people were building this, but when I opened it up, I was like, this, this, is this Python? Like, it's cool, but I have also this theory that the people today that are playing with Mojo, first they go for Mojo because of the performance, right? So they stay on the low level API stuff, right? The low level, so you can make things very fast. But because you do that, the code doesn't look as much like Python anymore. Um, also, uh, they do have these rough edges, right? So there's a lot of stuff you see there that is like, oof, like this, this doesn't look, this looks funky, right? For example, they don't have classes, but they do have structs, right? You have this, reg uh, this decorator thing, which with register passable, which I guess is something related to memory, like trivial, so a bit above my head. You also see you have some things like um, this var, right? So this is basically for mutable uh, objects. Right, so things that you can change afterwards. And let is for immutable, I wanna say, yeah. And then you have this fn functions for the low level stuff, right? Uh, what is the fn? Uh, let's compare two real quick, this is from their documentation. If you calculate the, uh, the Euclidean distance, you see that the main difference is here is that one, you have the fn instead of def. You also have these types, so again, this is the AI feature, so they actually have temp tensors built in the language. And you need to have type hints, or type hints according to Python, right? In Python, you don't need to do that. You have the var and the let. And again, the, the difference between them is that the var you can actually change afterwards. But you also need to declare what is mutable, what is not mutable. Right? And again, this doesn't look that different, but if you see a more complex project, you're going to see a lot more differences. For our case, back to my toy example, Fibonacci was actually very simple. The only thing I changed is the type int. So we actually capital INT, not lowercase int. 
uh, and let's see how it went. So also the baseline is a bit different because I was using a dev container, so there's a different things. And it comes with a CLI tool, right? So you can just run Mojo and then the high level API, which is what we saw before, the normal stuff. And then you have uh, like a low level API, which is using the FN, using the special type ins and whatnot. And then we can go from 60 seconds to 0.36 seconds. So super high improvement, right? But uh, maybe just one fun thing. This extension, the dot dollar sign is because the fire emoji is a valid extension for Mojo. So I just wanted to put it there, but uh, my terminal didn't catch that well. Um, so yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, and for the triangle. So I was not able to get it to work, actually, because it is a bit more complex. So let me go through my list of excuses before you guys judge me too much, right? So first thing is, I was like, okay, I need to refactor the code because the code was in a CSV, so I needed to first parse it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So okay, they didn't have CSV, they didn't have dictionaries, and I'm using default dict, right? So okay, let's first figure that out. Um, and then I was like, okay, actually, but I don't need, I'm not timing everything, I'm just timing the calculation of triangles, right? So I don't need to parse the CSV, I can do that in Python, and then I pass it into Mojo because they have this conversion, right? But then I had this issue, cannot implicitly convert pi object to object, okay. What else can we do? Let's try to re-implement re the CSV parsing, even though it's gonna be throwaway code because we're not gonna time it, but let's give it a try. So then I first was having like a placeholder none, that's where the static typing started to kick my ass. Uh, I, I also, there are some type differences because you have a string literal versus a string. So if it's something that you define as a constant, it's a literal. So then you could not convert these things and it was an error. And then I kept trying, 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 like the seasons changed, you know, a lot of stuff happened and then I was like, Okay, I got a C++ error, some assertion failed, please submit a bug report to it. I was like, fuck, fuck, it's not worth it. <laughs> not worth it. Um, so I, if someone knows, <laughs> it's open source, right? You can try yourself, <laughs> you can correct my code. Um, so I was not able to do it. So, quick recap. This is basically everything that I've tried. Not so surprisingly, Pio3, so that's the Rust stuff, uh, came out first. Uh, and also, but Mojo did come out first for the Fibonacci, what I could time it. Uh, but again, it wasn't smooth sailing. It wasn't a drop-in replacement. So, my final thoughts on this. Um, if, you, if you take a step back, basically all these alternatives are either a different interpreter of the Python language, meaning that instead of running Python something, you run PyPy something, right? But it's the same code. Or you have other languages that are in the back end, right? So you have other languages coming in the back end of like Cython and MyPyC and the bindings and stuff, right? Other languages are run inside the Python standard interpreter, right? Also, these things change a lot depending on the use case, right? So it goes back to my benchmarks being wrong. So always benchmark your stuff, see what is there, test, you know, don't just take my word for it or anyone else's. My practical opinionated guide, so if I have a Python script that is running slow, what are the things that I would do? considering not having to refactor a lot of things, and uh, speed, right? So first I would start with Python 3.11, actually maybe even 3.12 nowadays. Try PyPI if it's an application, if it's not a package, so if it's not something that someone else needs to install, I'll go for PyPI. Then I'll use first MyPyC or Cython, and then I'll try the bindings in Rust and Mojo out there because I feel like it's still very early. I wouldn't uh, recommend it yet. So, Fair question. I shared this with a colleague as well. And then he's like, well, Rust is so great. Why don't you just write it in Rust in the first place? Why do you need this whole friend stuff, right? And I was like, yeah, that's true. But writing stuff in Rust also takes longer, right? It is a different programming language. It is more pedantic. So it, you do get the performance benefits. But it's not like the develop development time is not the same, right? So I see a world where you have a Python project and then something is low, you profile, you see, okay, this function is low, and then you optimize that with Rust or whatever you want to do, right? And this is already the reality in Python, right? Like uh, in the world nowadays, you see TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Polars, basically there are these very, that you need high, the, the very performant computation is written in C++, is written on lower level language, and then you can stay in the high level API, right, for doing the things that give you the productivity. <laughs> After I shared this as well, a lot of people are like, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? What about this? And I was like, yeah, I know. This is not a comprehensive view of everything that is in the Python community, right? There's a lot of stuff. So for example, did you try Numa? No, I didn't. Uh, PyBind 3.11, so uh, PyBind, PyBind 11, which is the C++ stuff. No, I didn't. Uh, Codon, no, I didn't. MicroPython, Piston, Rust Python, <laughs> Python 13, no gil. 
Other use cases, no, I didn't try that. But I think these are all very valid, right? And after that, I was thinking to myself, maybe I can refactor my repo to uh, allow people to contribute, right? So that's actually something still ongoing, but if you'd like to contribute, maybe stay, keep an eye out for it, um, and hopefully soon you'll be able to just kind of make a pull request and we run something on a VM to actually benchmark all these things. And I think the most important thing, I know my time is almost up, um, is that we are stronger with friends. So the code will be available there. Uh, I'm also gonna put it on the Discord uh, chat, but this is the repo and Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> I so if anyone has any questions, your Can time. Uh, super cool talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one question on the very beginning of the talk, you had this disassembly of that code where you saw that when you executed a million times, it changed the bytecode. Mm -hmm. Does that happen kind of after n executions? Python realizes, oh, I need to change it, or does it happen reading the whole loop and uh, kind of seeing like, oh, I need to execute this a million times, therefore I change it? How does Python do that internally? Do you know? My understanding is that it actually counts the number of times it's executed, and then once it hits a certain threshold, then it will optimize the bytecode. That's called like bytecode specialization, so you can take a look. Uh, it's not all operations that do that, but basically they count the number of times that that operation is being run. Ah, yeah. cool. And also if you go back, so like we saw that this is a, an integer, right? So I think, uh, no, this is not it, right? Um, if this is not, if this you do with an integer first, and then you go back to the using a float or something, you go back to the generic bytecode uh, instruction, I guess. Yeah. Huh, so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, nice talk. Uh, congrats. Uh, I saw that you. Um, did the, with the Cyton um, version, you did uh, the typing, right? But you didn't do any, because I think you can embed C++ code there. Uh, you didn't do that, right? No, I didn't do that. So basically, again, my experiment was what's the, if I'm a developer and something's low, what would I do, right? Would I run C++ and probably just rewrite C++? So I wanted to do what's the minimum amount of effort, like what's the best bang for your buck, kind of, right? So first I run it with just the normal type ins from Python, and then I change the, those type ins with the Cyto ones, right? So, bum bum. Is this here? Yeah, so basically I run once, well, like this, and then once like that. Well, this, this Fibonacci is very simple, that's why I put it here. But like the, for the triangle stuff, it was the same, right? I run first like this, and then like that. Nothing fancier than this. Make sense? Okay, okay. Just, just to know if uh, maybe that version, I mean, doing that s low level Cython would compare to the Rust version? I don't know. Just, yeah, I just think so. Thought. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. Uh, I think it's like, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert in these things as well. So I'm fairly certain that there are ways you can even further improve the site on and wha whatnot, right? I think there are ways you can, you can get more out of it. Um, but I also think that as a Python developer, where I hope most of us are here, I think it's like, what is feasible to you, right? You have a deadline next week, Friday. What are the things you're gonna spend on? Like, what, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you. Yeah, but that's a good point. Are there oh, more there. questions? Thank you for your talk. And so, is Python fast? Then? <laughs> yes. But it can be faster with friends. <laughs> I guess that's it for <laughs> See you next week. Nice talk. Uh, congratulations. Uh, what tool did you use to get the fancy videos of the terminal? That yes. They, so they're cool. This. Um, this is actually a ASCII, ASCII, it's like ASCII, 
Cinema. So it's like a pun with ASCII when cinema. Ah, okay. So basically, you record. This is a recording of my terminal, um, and this is not a video actually. So actually, I can select text. Uh -huh. Right. It basically changes the text dynamically, and you have some CSS stuff. Um, so this is this presentation is running on the browser because it's uh, it's LeadDev is the like a framework. It's kind of like Vue.js, but it's different. It, like has Vue components and whatnot. And I wrote the integration to put this here. So it is very hacky. <laughs> So if you want to contribute, that also is very uh, appreciated as well. But that's why maybe I, I can show if I click outside. Oh, no, this actually was okay. But sometimes the sizing is a bit off. But, uh, the but long story short, this is Askinema, as Aski Cinema. Yeah. 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 So that you can actually go on the Git repo as well and have a look and all these things. But that uh, was a, a, a very cool way to show the demos. Thank you. Yeah, I think also live coding, I'm like, <laughs> not going to do that. <laughs> no. Uh -oh. Cool. Anything else? Thank you very much then.